Okay, while many will know Tim Mueller as a national and even global business leader and visionary and entrepreneur, Tim's roots are decidedly Cleveland, and he played a very important part in Cleveland tech history. So it still does, actually. So good to see you, Tim. How Dan, you doing? Great to see you as well. You know, speaking of Cleveland, you were a Rhodes High guy, James Ford Rhodes High School. Yeah, it was fun. That part of it, being able to come back to work with the city, uh, you know, having grown up in the old Brooklyn area was uh, really meaningful and, and still is as far as the love for this city. You know, you were, uh, I understand you were a track guy. What'd you, what'd you do? <laughs> well, I wasn't the fastest guy, but uh, I ran uh, the um, 400 meter, oh. the 330. It, it, those are kind of where you just want to throw up after those are you're done with burners. those. Those are lung burners, yeah. That's... End of the meet, you always do the mile relay, and everyone tries to hide from the coaches at the end. But we had a great coach with uh, Coach Zickis, who ended up going over to, to Lakewood at the end. But uh, fond memories of James Ford Rhodes, for sure. You know, I think we first met in the early 90s when uh, you had this vision. Uh, you saw the potential of this thing called the Internet, you know, for commercial applications and all. And you and your, your partner formed this uh, company, Vantage One. Tell us how that came about. Yeah, you know, it was really an interesting side of it because we originally started as a marketing firm. We are doing brochures, annual reports, things on that line. And um, we ran into Ron Kopfer. And Ron had introduced us to doing interactive kind of CD-ROM touch base or touch screen kiosks. And uh, so we would sell the jobs, sub it to um, Ron Kopfer and Associates at the time, and they would put this together. And we started realizing this really had a lot of legs to it. So we started bringing in people to learn the ability to do some of the programming and development of interactive communications. And right around 1995 or so, we found Advantage One in 1990, um, around 95, uh, a woman by the name of Mary Amney Ingalls uh, had said, listen, this thing called the internet is huge. I'm a researcher, librarian. And so she invited Dan Rose, my, my co-founder of Advantage One and myself, to her home on a Sunday. And I remember so clearly, it was a kind of a crappy winter Sunday her husband's in the living room watching NFL football, and she takes us back into her little office in her, her house. She cranks up the modem, you hear the and all of a sudden, she starts showing us the internet, and Dan, I'm telling you, Dan Rose and I looked at each other, it was like the clouds parting, right. the angels were singing hallelujah, because we realized that what we were trying to pack on, these three and a half inch discs or the CD-ROM that had a finite amount of information you could hold, can now be unlimited. And very early browsers, Mosaic, were the ability to kind of work around there. But we also realized that nobody was really lending a graphic touch to what was going on with browser-based communication. So we felt the marketing end, the graphic designers we had, you know, we already had hired you know, Molly uh, Sindelar, who's now Molly Markey, and, and Chris Ramsey, who were wonderful designers. And how do we now take that kind of information designing and drop it onto a screen. So that's where Vantage One really got its start. And before you know it, Dan, it exploded. We were in the C-suite at GE Lighting, KeyBank, Eaton Corporation. We flew on private jets of the CEOs wow. because they didn't know enough about it, but they had to address their shareholders. So we would go and take, go and, and stand in at the shareholder meetings and talk about the future of the internet and, and why GE Lighting particularly or Kelly Staffing Services um, needed to get on board with the web. So I would say 80% of our sales um, process was education. I remember Mary Amney, she was in the Greater Clean PC Users Group, and really a smart lady and a, a cool lady. You know, I, didn't, I didn't know that connection really. Let's just see what you learn here. Yeah. Cleveland Tech history. And I do remember walking into Ron Coffer because we were in the same building, the Caxton. Yeah. At that point, I said, Ron, we're shifting to the internet. We're going away from the CDs. Um, and he said, I'm staying CD for a while. <laughs> and then he pivoted very quickly uh, to also be there. So he was very instrumental in, in our education on what interactive digital marketing was. So it was the very early ages of digital marketing. You know, it's funny. I mean, guys like you and Ron made the, saw it and made the shift before guys like Bill Gates, who were laggards in the whole, okay, the internet is coming and all. But, so you, you, a couple of guys from 
Cleveland, a team you put together, and you're suddenly dealing with Exxon and Eaton and Key Bank and GE Lighting and all. And you guys got your name out there locally, nationally. How, I mean, you, you're new marketing, obviously, when you started the company and all, but how'd you, how'd you get it out there, that branding? Yeah, you know, we, we naturally, because there was a, a curiosity by the media and what this World Wide Web was, but one of the best moves we made was hiring Mary Patton, yeah. who ended up being our marketing director through our sale at the very end in 1999. And she was incredible the way that she would just take morsels of data and, and be able to, to uh, push it out to media. So she was able to generate stories, not only locally with the Plain Dealer, but also Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune, all those were, we were basically quoted in or stories done. And that helped us quite a bit as we tried to further push out this whole gospel on, on what was digital marketing. So we're very fortunate. And then we partnered with The Plain Dealer. I'm not sure if you remember this or not, but The Plain Dealer started launching websites for the Rock Hall, Great Lakes Science Museum, Museum of Art. So we were out buying those domains early um, we bought clevelandindians.com and we bought grandprix.com. So we started squatting on a bunch of sites and we would then use those for our clients and eventually move those over to them, the rightful owners of those domains. But um, the Plain Dealer, we did a partnership with to launch all those nonprofit websites and they felt that was a good connection back to the Plain Dealer. And in exchange, they were doing a ton of stories every time we would, I mean, consider this, every time you launched a website, it became a story with a headline. You know, that's how early this was. Not necessarily akin to Watson, come here, I need you, yeah. but it was very exciting, very heady times. You know, it's for the younger people watching this, this is all, social media wasn't even in the, in the dreamscape there. You know, this was, uh, you couldn't just tweet this out or, or post on Instagram or something. So it, it's really amazing. And a couple things you touched on there, you know, this was, we talk about Web 2.0 and all this. This, you know, barely Web 1.0. This was the pioneer days. This was the old Wild West there. And mm. you talk about those domain names. I mean, you know, the big, Charlie Stack had the vision to pick up books.com, cleveland.com, and you get, just got some of those, which today you couldn't, you couldn't get those, you know, with a, a ransom. What what was that like just to be able to go grab names? Oh, they were 80 bucks a piece. Oh my God. And we, and we were buying them and we were just trying to figure out all of them. But then there were also some of those early frontier frontiersmen that were buying up like IBM.com and trying to ransom yeah. those to IBM. And the courts very quickly started reverting to patent law and trademarks. And, and so IBM rightfully had the, the ownership of those type of domains. But some of them, well, the other ones weren't quite clear, but we realized that that was our foray to buy those. And then we would turn around and go back to those companies and say, we bought the domain already for you. We can get a website up in, in no time. And then that f really got us um, our roots planted within those large companies. At one point, I think we had 12 Fortune 500 companies for a little firm in Cleveland. Wow. And we were then dictating to their large international um, advertising agencies what we were going to do. And so that was a really odd twist of almost a power struggle. And I think a lot of the also local ad firms here did not like us um, giving the digital strategy for their clients, whether it was Medical Mutual of Ohio or Steris. You know, we, we were the ones that were we, we, rightfully the experts. And we found that the little dirty secret is that if we were just a half a step ahead of everybody else, we, we maintain that expertise. Oh, and, yeah. and that was the fun part, was staying ahead of everyone else. You know, tell me about uh, something you called nonlinear communications and, and how you implemented that. Yeah, it wasn't really about that kind of, it wasn't um, communications that went from point A to point B. It zigzagged almost like a Montessori school. It went all over the place. And it was our, our really our, our duty um, to make sure that we could be good stewards of this. Um, as the, the new inventions were coming along, there wasn't, it wasn't tied a lot to what we see now on social media with the partisan politics and all that. It was really, the purity of the internet was beautiful because it was really about being open source. Nobody was protective of their own you know, sides of it. It was all about sharing. 
even our competitors around the country. We would share information or new lines of code that would help the whole internet progress. It was the most communal or, uh, type of movement I've ever felt in my life. I mean, I get goosebumps even thinking about yeah. it because there was just so much collaboration and we all kind of nodded to each other like we knew this was something that was going to be incredible. And it really proven to be now, you know, 25 years later, um, even bigger than we ever thought. Oh, yeah. You know, I remember you guys brought a kind of Silicon Valley flair to Cleveland. I mean, it was our first taste of it, really. First, you said you were in the Caxton building. And I remember from your office, you could look out into uh, Jacob, what was then Jacob's Field right. for the Cleveland Indians, you know. That, that was wild. I mean, what a great location there. Oh, it was fun. We used to have opening day parties where Racco Scotty came and sang the <laughs> national anthem. Dan and I had tickets for the Indians game, and if we opened our windows at the Caxton building, we could hear the last line of the national anthem and be in our seats before first pitch. Oh, so man. just wonderful to be in that area. But the beauty of the Caxton building is we started getting more and more like firms that went in there because we had high-speed internet coming in there to the building. Uh, we also had a lot of fun. Um, we remember sending interns and timing them to run from the top floor <laughs> down to the bottom, grab a Snickers bar, and then come back up and see what their timing was. It was stuff that would never be able to be probably legal today. <laughs> yeah. But one of the fun things is that when we had new employees join the company, we had something called hand on the wall. So as soon as they came in, we had a giant wall in the, in the cafeteria area and we'd have them come in front of everybody and we'd just pepper them with questions like, what high school did you go to? Tell us about your prom. What's the last book you read? What's the best vacation? And from that, we were able to create these kind of planned accidental relationships. It's like, oh, you played the oboe in high school, so did I, or you were, you know, um, you're of Slovakian heritage. And then we'd have these potluck dinners where everyone would bring Pots represented their heritage because we were so much into the international touch of what Cleveland is. Yeah. And at the very end of each session, we'd have them pick out a color of paint that best represented their personality. They'd put their hand in it, put their hand on the wall, and then sign their name with the date they joined. And everyone would celebrate. So we literally celebrated people coming into our company. And then when they left, we always told them, you know, we can't guarantee you'll be here for five months or five years, but when you leave, We'll guarantee that you're a better professional, and we'll celebrate your leaving as well. Where a lot of companies turn their back, they escort them out the door with security, and we felt like everybody did put their handprint on the company, so we may as well celebrate them either way, coming or going. That that is so cool. I know you guys had a lot of wild stories and things that went on uh, there. Of course, you're getting your work done. That's the main thing. But providing an environment that people enjoyed it and felt comfortable, and were able to do their best and uh, you got to tell us about the Pepsi story. You know, we uh, we were competing with uh, another firm for the Cleveland Indians project because we already bought clevelandindians.com and launched an initial site for it and um, <clears throat> if you remember back then, Dan, um, the Indians had an exclusive relationship with Pepsi right? and they were the corporate stakeholders for the entire stadium, everything was Pepsi. And the unwritten rule is that you're not even allowed to drink another <laughs> soda in that building because you never know when Pepsi was going to be coming through and, and they were a giant advertiser. So we knew the guys behind us were going to pitch for the business as well. So we popped a couple cans of Coke in our bag. Oh. And as we walked out, they were in the <laughs> lobby and it was still chilly. We said, yeah, it was grueling, grueling pitch we just made. You guys want a couple of soft drinks on the way in? <laughs> And we gave it to them, and they opened them up and walked in, and we understood that they got their ears rimmed out, oh, rimmed out a little terrific. bit for having Coca-Cola in the building. <laughs> so, but you know, fun things like that. We, we made an acquisition in Dallas, and at the very end, there was a ten thousand dollar bonus that the sellers wanted to um, make us pay. And in the building where we were buying the company, they had a gymnasium, so we just suggested that we do a free throw. Uh, best out of 10 to see who could get that $10,000. That's amazing. And uh, fastest 10000 we've ever made in our lives. Really? But, um, but, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that in this kind of craziness of everything that was swirling, um, you know, we felt that we were good business guys, but everything was so fast-paced that, you know, if I had my druthers, we would have hired a COO much earlier in the game. Yeah. And we ended up bringing on Brian Powers. 
in the last couple of years before we sold to GTCR, a private equity firm. And Brian single-handedly got his arms around the tiger. You know, it, they, things were like, you know, they were just free-flowing. And he put structure to the business. He brought a, a new accounting system in. Staff meetings were more structured. And it didn't take away from the culture of the business, but it made us more seductive when it came down to selling. And we didn't really build it to sell. Um, and I'll tell a quick story about raising capital during that time. But, um, you know, Brian was an integral part of us being able to put just the, the systems together that made us more valuable for a buyer. Um, but, you know, in 1998, you know, we, we, were, we already made an acquisition in Dallas and we were going to go out for a financing round of, of tens of millions of dollars. And we sent Brian to this conference that was hosted by a company called Martin Wolf and Associates. And out in San Diego, and he met a guy by the name of Marty Wolf. Marty engaged with us, and we were going to hire him to raise money, real money, for making acquisitions beyond Dallas. We felt like if we if we did a circle of the Great Lakes area, we'd buy somebody in Detroit, Pittsburgh, Columbus, right. maybe Erie, and create this Midwest, um, you know, larger footprint. And this was now the beginning of '99, and Marty came to us and said, "Listen, I don't know when the crash is going to happen, but there are signs, and I've been in this long enough. I know when things are going to possibly crash." And so, within a couple of days, Dan Rose and Brian Powers and I turned the whole narrative back to, instead of being a buyer, to a seller. And uh, Marty took us around the country almost like prom queens. We went from city to city with US Web, you name it. All of the major web companies were interested in buying us. And Marty did an, a quasi-auction setting. And by the end of October 99, um, we elected to sell. And it was really bittersweet for us because, again, we did not build it to sell it. We wanted to become a much bigger powerhouse, um, but everything by early 2000 had crashed. Yeah. And, uh, and the good thing is when we made the announcement, we did large bonuses to people, whether you were there for a couple months or there for many years. People were paying off the mortgages of their homes. It was really a wonderful thing that we felt uh, when we sold, um, and a lot of people felt good about it. And the, the, the market did crash after that, which was really difficult, um, which tells you that there are ebbs and flows of technology, and you have decades sure. that go on there. But I think one of the things that we talk about is one of our greatest accomplishments, but the biggest miss. And I think we all have these, like, one minute we're celebrating, the next minute we think that it wasn't a good move, is that in 96, we talked to IMG, who were the hosts of the Cleveland Grand Prix. And we proposed to them that we wanted to be the world's first broadcast of a sporting event on the Internet. No one had ever done any sporting events on there. This is long before Mark Cuban had done his whole push to sell to, to Yahoo. And so we talked young, to... Young people aren't going to believe that, you know, that sports weren't always out there and all. That yeah. The first came from you guys. Go on. Yeah, and we, we, it was going to be rudimentary by nature, but what we did was we set up a relationship with IMG. They gave us a space in the media area of um, the, the downtown Burke Lakefront Airport where that perennial Grand Prix race was taken. And we literally got guys with these large, old format, very first generation digital cameras that were, I don't know, five pounds or so. Yeah. And we put them all around the outside of the, um, of the track. And they came in, they shot digital stills, came in, downloaded them onto the computers. We digitized wow. them, put them onto online. And then we just made a relationship that day with uh, the voice of IndyCar Racing, Paul Page, where we were recording him on a cassette player oh, on a small like Kmart <laughs> mic. Yeah. And we would then download his voice and digitize that. And then we talked to the guys. What was the name of the firm that Zabig and Ian Vershern? APK. APK. They came and they set up servers um, over phone lines so that we could then push all of the digital photos and just little snippets of the race being wow. called online. And all of a sudden they start seeing hits from Brazil and Italy, where you know Grand Prix racing is so important and critical, and we all looked at each other and said, "Oh my God, this thing is going to be so huge." So we did that for a couple of years, and the challenge, Dan, is that we were so happy to have done a first, 
but we didn't see what Mark Cuban saw. Right. And so he went around and he didn't take it from us. He saw the fact that this was a viable business model and he got in, you know, trains, tr planes and automobiles and over a year's time signed up every major um, college st station he could to have the exclusive rights to broadcast the audio of sporting events. Big Ten, he started with his, I think his alma mater in Indiana and sold it to um, Yahoo for almost $2 billion. Wow. And Yahoo then closed it, that down like three years later, the whole division. But we didn't see it, even though it was such a big thing, because we went back to our knitting, where we were sure. launching websites and doing e-commerce work. Um, so an interesting history on that. That's amazing. I remember my first digital camera was a Logitech Photo Man. It was a big honk, and a big, as big as a shoe, and it's just black and white, of course, but you could take a picture and you know get a digital, digital representation. It's amazing. Let me just step back a second. Um, You've always been uh, uh, interested in music, too. I mean, you were on the board at Cleveland, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum for 15 years, chaired their uh, technology committee. But you you play bass or guitar or something, don't you? Yeah, all through college, high school, uh, played a lot. And still, as my kids were growing up, I always played the acoustic guitar to put them to sleep at night. Um, but yeah, th that was a big part and still is. Uh, like everybody, it, it, music really puts you in a place in time. Yeah. And, and I think part of the idea of being involved with the Rock Hall was that is our international representation along with the, you know, the orchestra and the Cleveland Clinic. Those three things are really the things that represent Cleveland. And then you have some brands like Sherwin-Williams and all that and Eaton that also represent Cleveland. But um, yeah, the Rock Hall, I, you can't even put words by how important that oh, is. Oh, yeah. You know, I never got to see it, but the rumor is that... Uh, you know, you were part of the deal, you and Dan with uh, Apple and Netscape and Kelly and, you know, these Vantage One clients to sell marketing on the Internet. And you took the show on the road, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And you went coast to coast. And how did how'd you loosen up the crowd? Is that a true story? Or is it, that it is a true story. I would actually tote my guitar on the plane or in the car and... Uh, uh, we would sing the, um, the Nasty Dirty website blues, and <laughs> we would make up different lyrics by depending on what city we're going to be in. And at the very beginning, we had the whole crowd standing up and singing, because it was just like a, you know, a, a, a four-chord regular blues, uh, yeah. you know, series. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was really fun to do that. We just wanted to differentiate ourselves from anything else, and Apple was just wacky enough to want to get involved in that. And, um, and, and so, really, we were hired by Apple to go around the country to really be those, um, you know, uh, singing the gospel of, uh, metaphorically speaking, of what was going on with the potential. And, and you had mentioned, too, long before Microsoft, they were very slow to the web. And Apple was feeling with their interface and the graphic design of desktop publishing right. how well that could then translate into browsers. And so um, we were a proud Apple shop all the way through because of its flexibility um, to be able to do that. So you had a, a major transition then, you know, after seeing the future and, and selling Vantage One, and you get into uh, public service, I mm -hmm. guess we'd call it, and you hooked up with uh, uh, the Mayor Jane Campbell administration. How did that happen? You know, we had sold um, Vantage One. I stayed on for about 18 months. And it was, I left just as she was being elected as our 55th mayor, first female mayor of the city of Cleveland, lots of promise. And uh, she called one day and said, hey, we've got mutual friends. I thought you might be able to help. It looks like you've got some time on your hands. And um, I went down to her transition office, really thinking that we might, you know, I might host a blue ribbon committee or help with the technology, right. uh, you know, rehab of the city. And literally before I know it, I had one hand on the Bible, one hand swearing <laughs> in, and came in as deputy mayor of the city, head of development. So that was city planning, housing, uh, workforce development, uh, economic development. It was a fairly large portfolio within the city. And she said, listen, um, I want you to take the chief of staff's office next to mine. This is really a big part of it, but I need the city to know that we're open for business. Because as powerful and as strong of projects that Mike White had done while he was there. The last several years, there was a lot of contention with a lot of the business community. So I got on my saddle and went to every CEO's office 
in the greater Cleveland area and said, we are open for business. Wow. Sat down with Chris Connor at Sherwin Williams and I said, Chris, I know someday you're going to build a new HQ. <laughs> we don't want you to leave. And he said, on my watch, Tim, I will never leave. He said, first and foremost, I didn't support Jane Campbell getting elected, <laughs> but I respect her as the mayor and I respect what you're doing. On my watch, I will never leave this city with our headquarters, and he made good on that. Oh, that's great. Went to the CEO, Sandy Cutler, over at Eaton Corporation, and he said, we will not leave Greater Cleveland, I promise you. And even though it wasn't Eaton, it wasn't in the city of Cleveland proper, right. this is what we are. You know, if, if, the, if the suburbs and the core are not strong, we're not a good region. Right. And we wanted to really believe that the distance between uh, Luis Proenza and Akron U was the same in both directions. So we went down to Akron and talked with that, you know, with them to figure out how we could partner better with the University of Akron. Ed Hunter came in over at Case. We wanted to partner more with Case. So we took a really a wide approach to bringing the administration there. Um, but we also knew that we needed to lure businesses in because the days of bringing in the Boeings from Seattle to Chicago were not there. Sure. And the dirty little secret, Dan, is that when you lure companies, whether they're tech companies or not, from other regions, they don't provide all that many jobs. It's the ground base level things that really create the jobs. And we heard um, that Cisco Food Services at that time was looking to leave the Bedford Heights facility and potentially go down to Columbus where 70, 971 intersected or up to Toledo where 75 and 90 intersected or 80. And so we made a huge pitch. And we said, you know, if we're going to go after these guys, we want to treat this like a new business development pitch. So in that pitch, <clears throat> we had the CEO fly in from Cisco into the red room where the Cleveland oh, City yeah. Hall is, where you can see 35 people comfortably. And we had every major director and commissioner of every department gather around the table. So when the CEO came in, we had guys stand up with their business cards. And the first guy stood up is, my name is Ed Lohan. I'm the chief of police. Here's my business card, here's my home number, here's my cell phone number. I know nice. security and safety is a matter of importance. Next guy, Julius Chouch, I run water. Water is important for a food service company. Here's my home number, here's my cell wow. phone number. And they went around the whole table to a point where they, the CEO stood up and said, we have never had a pitch <laughs> like this, it's yours for the taking. And we ended up getting the largest payroll in the city of Cleveland in 35 years to move into the airport, uh, 55 acres of land with a million square feet of, of, um, of uh, capacity. So, but more importantly, I think we saw that technology was important because City Hall fell behind. Um, you know, people didn't have internet access out. Any emails could only be sent in between people at the City Hall. It's incredible. It really was. And you were very involved in this with us yeah. when we found out that we didn't have really any updated computers, like three and four 86s uh, in, in, on, the, um, on, the, on the desks. And you could tell part of the story as well of what we really needed from you guys. Sure, I, I know it's uh, Jim Cookenham, who was leading NEOSA, uh, spoke with you and Mayor Jane, and, and like you say, you had your hand up there quick. It's very hard to say no to Mayor Jane. Um, she's very persuasive, but uh, Cookenham came up with the idea that you know, to upgrade, it was a, an embarrassment and you guys couldn't do your jobs because the computers, we're here in the offices, the Resource Center of Computers Assisting People, and we wouldn't accept the kind of stuff back then that you guys were using to run this billion dollar city. So Cookingham came up with the idea for adopt a computer. And I don't know, I think we came up with like 25 brand new computers we built and raffled them off and put a, a, a a sticker on them, who they were donated by, and then uh, Mayor Campbell pulled out the name for the one that would be on her desk, and it turned out, honestly enough, it was Jim's mother's computer. You know, she donated go, one go. of her. Yeah, go. so that was so the computer that was sitting on Mayor Campbell's desk was uh, donated by um, Jim Cookenham's mother through the Adopt a Computer program. Well, the crazy thing is, she had Office Max, Eaton, all all donating you know, fifteen hundred dollars each. And these, now all of a sudden, City Hall had these flat screen, yeah. large monitors with ample power behind it. And it really was a great example of public-private partnership. It wasn't a multi-billion dollar thing, but it gave us the tools. And then we opened up the pipe so that people could actually receive and send emails to developers and business owners. 
just further showing that it was open for business. And then, you know, Mayor Campbell really wanted to bring in a technology czar. Exactly. Somebody who could focus on making sure that we were ready for the next century to go forward. So Tim Moran was the logical choice, he was a great guy, entrepreneur, started talking with people all around the city to create more connection with technology. And um, really a great guy to, to kick that off and spend a couple of really strong years building that whole Texar office. And so we felt good that that was a good start for the city of Cleveland to come out of the dark ages. And all of a sudden, um, you know, businesses responded and said, you know, we are here to stay and, and, and uh, real proud of that time. I think, uh, you know, there's some really good people around the Tim Moran, like you say, and Chris Ronane was around then working with you. You had a nice team. Um, some of the stuff you put together that we're not even touching on now with the technology, things like um, the invigoration, the, the re reinvigoration of East 4th Street. Mm. You know, some of those projects just, and I, I see some of it in our current mayor who he wants to do some of the things, the approaches that uh, that you worked on, like that that story with the having all the st the leaders there with the business card, just blowing them away, right? You know, and just locking it in right there. That's that's the kind of stuff I, you don't hear about. Everyone's very standard in their presentations and formulas, and you know, you you lose out on things because of that, especially a city like Cleveland which is, there's a lot of competition for. Well, there. businesses will, will backbend away from having to deal with cities. I recall when Symbionics came in from Israel, um, it was a, a company that high technology for robotics and we were pitching them to come in. And um, at that point, city council was going to approve a million dollar grant loan that could be a grant to Symbionics. And they announced on Friday that they were gonna do the hearing on Monday. Well, the CEO and all of the major founders of the company were based in Israel, and they could not get there by Monday. So I remember Bill Stanford from um, Stanford from uh, Steris. Um, he was the one of the founders of Steris. He was a big advocate to lure in um, with uh, with um, Beju Shaw some of the new companies that were going to come in, and he sat in for them. And I remember it was telecasted. And talk about swimming in peanut butter in a goldfish. The city council members were grilling Bill on where he lived, what his house was worth, wow. all the things about. And Bill said, listen, I am just representing a company. I'm volunteering for this. I have nothing to gain by it. I'm volunteering to let try to get these companies to locate their U.S. presence in Cleveland. And they just fried him on TV wow. uh, unnecessarily. And the TV camera shut off. And a couple of the council people came up and shook his hand and said, sorry, nothing personal. My constituents are watching on TV. Bill looked at me and he said, don't ever ask me to come down here again. So yeah. that mentality was really alienating for, um, and everybody's got their, 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 their um, agendas sure. that they've got to try to do. And I appreciate everything the city council does to represent their constituents. No doubt about that. But to lack the awareness and the filter to alienate very pe powerful people that could help our city just made my head explode yeah, on a regular that's, basis. That's but, painful. Yeah, but overall, you know, we did progress, and, and, and you do move the ball down even if it's short yardage at, at a time, you know, two yards in a cloud of dust. Exactly. But eventually you left public service, that part, and went back to your roots. Uh, you became CEO and vice chairman of a, a Silicon Valley startup. Tell us about that. It was. So talk about manifesting, Dan. I, I, was, I left City Hall because Mayor Campbell had said, listen, if, if you don't have plans of going all the way through the election cycle and into the next second term, if you are one of the chiefs, uh, you know, chief of, of finance or the chief of development or the chief of safety, um, it's better that you step back now than leave in the middle of a campaign cycle. And so I felt like I wanted to, I put in three really hard years, I had a young family, I had three kids under the age of four, wow. um, and it just felt the right time to go back to the private sector. So I respectfully told you know, Mayor Campbell, thank you for the opportunity, I think we did some good work, I'm gonna go back into private. So I spent about six months, and, and this is a lesson for anyone who's still now 35 minutes into this listening <laughs> of manifesting what you think you want is that I wrote down on a piece of paper, I want to do a Silicon Valley startup 
I hadn't raised large sums of money before, so I wanted to do a money raise, as painful as that could be. I wanted to have an international flair. I wanted it to be a product versus a service. Um, and, um, you know, and I'd like to lead the effort. And so I posted that on my wall, and I'm doing research. Right. And I talked to different people around town about some startups, Tom and Brescia and a few others about doing some startups. And all of a sudden, a good friend of mine by the name of Randy Markey called up and said, Hey, Tim, I'm doing this project with a Silicon Valley startup that needs to raise money. It's a product. We think it's going to be international, and we need somebody to help us get the, 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 the company off the ground and be a CEO. And I literally looked up at my wow. se- side of it. I said, sweet baby Jesus. <laughs> you know, I cannot believe that he basically checked, checked every box wow. on this. And so I flew out and um, ended up commuting back and forth to Silicon Valley for seven years. We raised about $15 million from very notable investors, Dick Jacobs here in town, those summers, a number of guys. And we had a a game-changing technology that allowed to put high-speed internet through copper, twisted copper. And it was through DSL, which now is an old technology. And uh, we had some really, really great breakthroughs and then the recession of 2008, 2009, with the whole banks collapsed. And literally, we had telecoms from around the world saying, we love this technology. We're not going to be able to buy anything for about two years. Oh. And so what we thought was going to be a grand slam ended up being a stand-up single. We ended up selling that business to a company called Actelis. And oddly enough, it circled back to Lev Gonick, where they were using our products on the rooftop of CMHA housing to push out broadband uh, wirelessly to members of, of the, uh, <clears throat> the public housing uh, community. Yeah, you, you played an important role. A lot of organizations, like One Community here, uh, the Fund for Our Economic Future, Civic Innovation Lab, all that stuff. You still lecture Weatherhead sometimes, don't you? Yeah, every year I try to do a class, just talk about different case studies. Um, I feel that is a calling of being able to teach and I, and I incorporate that into every day when I'm at Martin Wolf here is to teach the younger people and even our own colleagues uh, even some of the basics about communicating you know, on a video camera or how you present yourself all the way to strategy. And I think that's really important. And, I, and I, it's interesting, Dan, because if you really kind of bring it full circle, Marty Wolf, who in 1999 convinced us to sell Vantage One, after I left biology in 2011, uh, I sat and talked with Marty, and we became good friends over the years and literally threatened each other that we were going to do business again <laughs> someday. And in 2011, we became business partners, and we wow. launched a company called ITX, which really was bringing buyers and sellers of tech companies together. Um, so instead of going the investment banking route where you, uh, you know, you're in the room and negotiating everything, ITX is really kind of a... Match.com for technology businesses. Okay. And we then now um, sell businesses that are less than 30 million in transaction value, so small mid market tech firms. And through ITX, um, you know, we, we uh, facilitate the sale of those businesses. Now, is, is Marty someone who's uh, similar to you? Is he complimentary, or do you guys, you know, fit in areas where you're weak and he's strong and something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a really good yin-yang is that, you know, we, we worked as great business partners for 10 years and last January we merged ITX with Martin Wolf and Marty asked me to run both organizations because <laughs> I don't know any better deal maker ever in, in my life. He, he is a consummate deal maker and that's what he loves to do. So he was really wanting to relieve himself of running the operations on a day-to-day basis of his um, investment bank. And so uh, through Martin Wolf Associates, we run both ITX and Martin Wolf Securities. And um, I think Marty would say that the, that the rocks in my head fill the holes of his. <laughs> you know, he is, um, he is all over the board creatively when he tries to get deals together. And much like the role Brian Powers played in Vantage One, I play that role to keep everything together, if you will, within the organization. And um, with, I've never had a, a better, stronger business partner than Marty. Wow. Um, I've learned a lot from him, but he is, uh, uh, yeah, ethical and, 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 and is still a very good friend. So we walk that fine line of being good friends, but also business partners. And um, we have, uh, you know, the, the market continues to be hot for M&A. 
And what it did was it really took those 25 years as an entrepreneur, an operator, and you fold that into being a deal maker. Um, it really makes it a lot easier in talking with entrepreneurs who have walked in those shoes. Let's, I, I have to ask you about one, another legendary person. How'd you connect with Mario Marino? Yeah, Mario. What a, what a legend he is. If, if Marty's one of the best business partners in the world, Mario is, um, you know, an incredible human being who he himself, you know, obviously was one of the godfathers of the Virginia Tech Belt, you know. And he and Steve Case from AOL were the guys who built up the whole Northern Virginia Tech Belt. belt. And um, it was an interesting story when Mario uh, decided to raise his children in Cleveland, which was driven by his wife, Dana, yeah. who was from Northern Virginia. And she said, listen, we, we visited your family so many times. Mario was a graduate of Case, grew up in Collinwood area, deep Italian roots. And she really wanted to raise their children here in Cleveland. And I saw there was an article of Mario coming here. I reached out and said, Mario, can you be kind of part of our kitchen cabinet with Mira Jane? Because we'd really love to learn how you built that Virginia Tech belt. And he said, I don't want to get involved in politics. I don't want to do that, but I'd love to help you out. And so um, from that became a really wonderful mentorship uh, that, that has grown over the years. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think any of that would be possible, any of these, without having to really mention Mark Morgenstern, because Mark was the partner in charge of Con Kleiman and then left to do his own um, investing and mentorship. But he's the one who introduced me to Jane Campbell. He's the one who introduced me to Mario Marino. He's the one who got me involved with Albert Ratner uh, because the Forest City and Ratner family was so integral in the development of Cleveland. And so a lot of that would never be possible without Mark's mentorship. And he, he and I are, continue to be best friends. And he's my go-to guy when it comes to mentorship. You know, I'm, I'm in my late 50s now, and I think anyone still, again, 45 minutes into this <laughs> or still listening, is that you could have mentors late in your life, and you need them to bounce things off because you need that, that person, metaphorically, who sits me down and says, now, Timothy. <laughs> Let's think this through. When they use do your that. full name, you yeah, know it's serious. Full name, and you know we, we go in our epic long walks around Shaker Lakes together. But there are a lot of unsung heroes like Mark and others in Cleveland um, who were responsible for so much of this foundational work. Uh, I think Mark Mark did over a thousand deals, many of which were tech based, and many of those based in Silicon Valley. Um, in order to, uh, throughout his career as a deal attorney and now as an entrepreneur. You know, it's, uh, I think I want to turn this, pause this and get in for this closing part with you here. But first, so start <laughs> over now, one, two, three, yeah, get a drink. <clears throat> so I gleaned a couple of uh, really good nuggets of advice here for for people who want to be the next Tim Mueller, you know, that, that list and having it there and having it spelled out and very concrete and then you can check off the boxes that you get it, the mentoring aspect. What else, what other advice would you give to someone who wants to be the next Tim Mueller? Well, I don't know about that side <laughs> of it, Dan. I appreciate it. But um, I would say that um, if you study entrepreneurs, whether they multi-billionaires, millionaires, or successful in whatever right they look at their their value um, I think persistence is probably the lowest and the common denominator among all of them so you know the idea that you're gonna fail and you're gonna fail and you're gonna fail over and over again I look at those as stripes on my arms you know maybe they're you know uh, signs of, of just experience but if you're persistent and you keep on going at it you're going to really succeed over time. Um, you know, I think about like even someone like Mel Mike Belsito, still a young guy in the entrepreneur's community, community. He came up with another, with another gentleman, the idea of doing funerals online. And, um, and it's a, it was a deal that it's, it's going to happen. The business is such, such uh, has shuttered, but it was probably a generation ahead of its time to be able to say, hey, listen, your loved one died in Cleveland, but you're in California and you've got to plan a funeral right away and you don't want to be necessarily um, going just to the first 
funeral home that shows up, right. how do we put this into an auction setting? That didn't succeed, and Mike went on to many different different things that he's doing right now and is immensely successful with industry and online and, and physical conference. And I think that's a great example of persistence for entrepreneurs to understand is that um, it's not going to be a one hit and you're, you're one and done. Um, I would say, think Jeff Bezos and everybody else talks about persistence. That's one thing. Two is that be a lifelong learner. Someone that is always curious, someone that's always looking to figure out how to do something differently. I'm inspired by my wife Celeste all the time by her curiosity and her ability to say, why does it have to be done that way? Let's do it a different way. You know, um, and then the idea of mixing in creativity with business. We always think about the analytical side and what are the numbers, what are they, but the fact of the matter is there was creativity in bringing that CEO into that red room and making everyone stand up and tell their life story yeah. and, and, and create that relationship. And the last thing I will say is that I think that looking back, the real measurement of whether or not you're successful in business is whether or not you could keep things relational versus always transactional. Because in the end, your eulogy notes can talk about money you made and deals you created, but how you make people feel, like Maya Angelou always talks about, really matters. So I think that balance of keeping things relational as you do things that are transactional kind of sum up the whole whole thing. So Tim, you know, I don't see as much as we used to because you're all over the world. You're Silicon Valley and Arizona and all over. But one of the good memories I have of seeing you fairly recently was that June afternoon, 2016. I remember I was walking down to your Chester Superior, headed to 9th Street, and you were there already. And we were there with 1.3 million of our closest friends celebrating <laughs> that Cavs championship. And we just we hugged each other. It's like two, high fives. Two Cleveland guys who have been through so much. It was like finally we got our championship. That was yeah, it's an amazing day. Such a great thing. And I know that you, between the international community, your love of Cleveland, your family roots. Um, you know, I don't think there's enough said about you, and you'll probably edit this out. And I hope <laughs> yeah. you don't. But there's not enough said about what you do, Dan. That is truly metaphorically and physically behind the camera to make this a better city. Your heart is as giant as, as this country is, what you do for the underprivileged with your computers program and, and all the stuff you do to recognize our international heritage and how important it is to have that the immigrants that come in that make the foundation of our city and our country. So I want to thank you for everything that you've done. Well, I'm, I'm glad I can edit, but I, I do appreciate that. And I, I'll just say, you know, because the industry is still young, and it is, we're fortunate to have someone here like Tim Mueller who was there at the beginning, Web 1.0, if even that, you know, if it even got to one, and having all these first, the first sports online, all that stuff. And he's still active now. It, it's young enough to still be doing stuff now. And after playing this huge role in Cleveland Tech history, He's still doing it for us, and it's uh, it's been a pleasure and honor. Good yeah. to catch up with you Thanks, again, man. Tim. Good, always good. All right. Thank you, Dan.